I am. You guys, are you guys ready to get started? I can go ahead and uh, get this going. You guys ready? I am. Okay, okay. Um, Michelle, are you ready? Yes, unless there's something else on your mind, something we need no, to cover. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go ahead and have you introduce yourself and then I'll introduce myself and then I'll introduce uh, Dr. Harmon. So you go ahead and like open us up. I'm looking for Dr. Harmon's uh, bio right quick. All right, good so go morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Notary Gals webinar. My name is Michelle Riley. I am the lesser half of Notary Gals. Um, some of you that are here today, you've been here week after week, and it looks like we may have one or two of you who are new to Notary Gals. Phyllis and I have been working together for several years in bringing training that we feel is important to notaries, mobile notaries, and signing agents. And we do this every second Saturday of the month. Today, um, we will be talking about Alzheimer's and dementia and how it impacts us as notaries. I'm coming to you from North Alabama, from Huntsville, Alabama, where I am the owner of Notaries for Alabama. Um, we offer training, mentoring, and networking opportunities for notaries. And I'm really excited about this topic. Phyllis? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, like Michelle said, we are um, the notary gals and we've been bringing training uh, to you guys on the second Saturday of every month. Again, my name is Phyllis Trailer. I am the owner of the Texas Notary Public Training Academy and also the Texas Notary Patron Community. Uh, this Today we're going to talk about uh, Alzheimer's and we are really excited to have Dr. Renee Brown Harmon with us. Uh, she resides in Birmingham, Alabama, where she has recently retired from a 29-year career in family medicine. Dr. Harmon and her husband, the late Harvey Scott Harmon, shared, who was also a doctor, shared responsibilities at their medical practice and at their home with two daughters until Alzheimer's disease forced his retirement. Dr. Harmon is the author of the teaching memoir, Surfing the Ways of Alzheimer's, Principles of Caregiving That Kept Me Upright, and writes a weekly blog on topics related to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and we have her website, uh, www.reneeharmon.com, where you can find uh, her blog and additional information. Dr. Harmon is also a sought after speaker and volunteers as a community educator with the Alzheimer's Association. Again, Dr. Harmon, we are so glad that you agreed to share this information with us today. Turning it over to you. Thank you, Phyllis and Michelle both. So like Phyllis said, I'm, I'm coming to you from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. And um, so our local chapter is in, in Birmingham. It's Alzheimer's Association of Alabama. There are Alzheimer's Association chapters throughout the United States. Um, and I'm, I'm using two presentations today that the Alzheimer's Association has produced and combining information from both of them to give you an overview of what dementia is and what Alzheimer's disease is 
And then we're also going to look at the presentation um, titled 10 Warning Signs of Alzheimer's, and it contrasts what is normal with normal aging and what could possibly be more. Um, we did find out that the audio on some of the videos that are included in my um, presentation are uh, does not work really well. I'm going to try, but um, I may we may not be able to view all of the audio, view all of the videos that I wanted to share with you guys. So, like I said, we're going to start off first with. Um, understanding Alzheimer's and dementia. So these are our learning objectives and I'm, we're not going to do all of these. So I'm just, we're going to compare and, and define Alzheimer's and dementia. We're going to look at how Alzheimer's affects the brain and we're going to list the greatest known risk factors of Alzheimer's disease and then look at the staging of Alzheimer's disease. And then I'm going to switch to the, another program. But let's get started on this since it looks like that's a lot of information. So first off is the impact of Alzheimer's disease. It I'm, I'm calling it our largest public health crisis in waiting. This is going to impact our health system now and in the future. So let's get some idea of about some numbers. So here, we've got a few little quizzes built in here. How many Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's disease? And the way I've got my screen set up, I cannot see you guys. I can only see um, my screen or what I've got. Um, but anyway, normally I would ask you to raise your hands, but since I can't see you, just kind of have it in your mind. All these are big numbers, right? But the answer is, 5.8 million. 5.8 million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's disease. And that number will go to 14 million by the year 2050. It's a huge number. And it's increasing because our population is aging. All right, here's another quiz. How many unpaid Alzheimer's caregivers are there in the United States? So these are family members and friends who are caring for a loved one. So if 5.8 million Americans are living with the disease, the correct answer is actually 16.2. That is about two and a half persons for every caregivers for every person living with the disease. That is taking a toll financially on the United States and on individual families and on individuals because this is time away from a job. I'm gonna play this video because there's not audio that you really have to listen to. These are some big numbers, Dr. Harmon. Huge numbers flying by. But this is a good takeaway number that every 65 seconds, someone is being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Here's another really easier number to remember. 10% of all Americans over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease, 10%. And that number is gonna go up to 14% by the year 2025. It's a huge public health issue. Here's another quiz. True or false, Alzheimer's is a normal part of aging. Hopefully you all guys know that it's false. Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease. It is not a normal part of aging. Medical science used to say that. We used to have a term called senile dementia, which just meant older people can't think as well. That's not true. So um, 
it is false. And last question on this section, people younger than 65 can get Alzheimer's disease. Well, I already gave that away because my husband had Alzheimer's disease. So it's actually fairly rare. Um, only, I think, 5% of all Alzheimer's disease occurs in people younger than age 65. Um, but it it's there. All right, so this is a video that um, explains about the different, uh, um, the definition of dementia and Alzheimer's. And since my video does, the audio on the video doesn't play well, I'm going to explain it. Um, let me find a slide that. I take it that didn't work, guys. Okay. It's, it's still Go ahead. coming. No. Okay. Okay, here. I'll just skip the videos and just kind of do the ex explanation. So, what Dr. Snyder was explaining is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. I find a lot of people use those terms interchangeably. Uh -huh. uh, Dementia is an umbrella term. It just means someone's cognitive abil abilities are impaired. They're not able to have memories or think clearly like they used to. It, and there are many causes of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common. 60 to 80% of all dementia is Alzheimer's. But there are other things that cause, cause dementia as well things like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia. They're all different. They all present a little bit differently. So it, it is important to know which one. So I, I find it as a clinician frustrating when a patient says, oh, my father doesn't have Alzheimer's, he has dementia. Well, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Dementia is a very broad term. It's like saying someone has headache, but it does, that does not tell you anything about what is causing the headache. It might be a brain trauma, it might be migraine, it might be stress. So it's very important to try to get the specific diagnosis, what type of dementia, and that's what a workup will do, is to hone in and get, get the correct diagnosis of what is causing the dementia. This section goes into um, what is causing it. And I, again, I wish you, we could see the video or hear the video, but Alzheimer's disease is caused by plaques and tangles in the brain. I'm going to put this slide up. Hang on. So plaques and tangles are two different proteins. They're malformed proteins that accumulate in the brain and they gum up the system. They gum up the works so that the, the signals can't pass through this gummed up system and brain cells die. So the, when the brain cells can't transmit signals and function, they will die and the brain slowly shrinks. We call it atrophy or shrinkage of the brain. And it occurs mostly in the, this part of your brain, the, the convoluted part that looks like a, a walnut. And as it shrinks, you can actually see that shrinkage on MRI scans. Um, so that is what is causing, that's what's causing Alzheimer's disease. We don't know what starts it. We don't know how to stop it. And this, this process actually starts a couple of decades before the first symptoms even begin. So my husband was diagnosed at age 50. If we had been able to do a brain biopsy at age 40, we would have seen abnormal amounts of plaques and tangles in his brain. 10, 15 years prior to his diagnosis. 
So the goal now in science is try to figure out how this starts and how we can stop it from, from spreading early on. All the, all the treatments we have now, we begin as soon as there are symptoms or when there are symptoms, but it's too late. The damage has already been done to a great extent. We can slow it down a little bit, but that's why we have such difficulty treating it right now. We don't understand how this process starts. So I'm going to stop right here and see if there are any questions. Um, about the definitions and about how this starts. And if uh, for the people in the audience, you can unmute yourself to ask the question, or if you want, you can post a question in the chat. So you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself. Dr. Herman, I appreciate you defining dementia or clarifying that I always I never knew the difference right. and you may have answered this do the in our cases notaries um is it important that we know the difference probably not no okay they're going to present kind of the same way to us yeah. Mm -hmm. To you, they would be. I think the shade, shades of differences are going to be not important to you. Okay. Yeah. But as a family member or of someone that you love, it is important. Yeah. I'm just like Michelle. I'm just blown away about the numbers. I had no idea deal with that prevalent. Yeah, it's amazing. And Phyllis, what that suggests to me is that we as signing agents and notaries, we're going to be encountering this more and more um, when we're out there going to homes, hospitals, and it just drives home the importance of knowing, being better prepared for it, what to expect at those appointments. That's true. And more and more people that may not even have that diagnosis yet, you know, because the numbers are increasing. Well, let's, let's move on then. So this next factor is just looking at risk factors and I'll just go through this fairly quickly since it doesn't really apply to you guys so much, but let's see, there's another video. So here's another quiz. What is the greatest risk factor, genetics, family history, or age? I'm going for family history. That's All my right. guess. Well, uh, the correct answer is, is age. Um, just the pure fact of aging puts us at risk. Um, so the, this, the, here's another number that will floor you. After the age of 65, the risk of getting Alzheimer's doubles every five years. Yikes. And I just told you 10% of people over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease. So it's not that the percentage doubles, but your risk doubles. So 32% of people over 85 have Alzheimer's. But, but let's break this down. And this is kind of where it goes next is the genetics and family history because they are important. They are risk factors. Um, so here are some more populations at risk. Um, Hispanics are one and a half times as likely to develop Alzheimer's as Caucasians. African Americans twice as likely. And women. Two thirds of people with Alzheimer's in America are women. We don't know why these three populations specifically are at higher risk. We think maybe, maybe Hispanic and African American are at increased risk because they also have an increased risk of vascular disease, heart disease, stroke, and there is something called vascular dementia. Um, so that might partially explain why those two populations. And with women, we know women live longer and that partially explains why women are at an increased risk 
of Alzheimer's, but it doesn't paint the whole picture. So here's the summary slide. Um, and I'll, I'll explain about um, family history and genetics. So family history is important, is an important risk factor. And the more family members you have, the greater your risk is, but it's not absolute. You could have five family members with Alzheimer's disease and never get it. Um, you could have no family members with risk with Alzheimer's disease and still come up with Alzheimer's disease. So it's a risk factor, but and genetics is a risk factor um, in in two ways. And um, you could have a gene that puts you at increased risk. There again, if you have the gene, you may not get the disease. You may, but you're at a higher risk. Um, and there are also genes that will absolutely cause you to get Alzheimer's. And that's typically in younger onset Alzheimer's disease. And they've named, we've got about four genes. But most people, even with younger onset Alzheimer's disease, do, do not have one of those genes. My husband did not have one of those, those genes. So the reason age is a risk factor is we all age. So we're all at a risk of Alzheimer's disease as we get older. I thought that was kind of a trick question myself. So any questions here before we go to the next section? Okay. No questions. So, no questions. So we're gonna move on to um, the stages of Alzheimer's disease. And can't play those. So what I'm going to do is find this slide. Actually, I'm going to leave this slide up, but just ignore the audio. Uh, I hate that. So I'm going to talk over her and um, tell you there are three main stages of Alzheimer's disease, early, middle, and late. And you can also hear mild, moderate, and severe. Um, th these are big, broad terms, and we use them a lot in medicine. Early stage. I, I, I break these three, you can look at these three on how a person functions in daily life. Early stage, a person is usually independent, very independent. You probably can't tell just with um, interacting, simple interactions that they have any problems. Middle stage, they need help. They cannot live independently. They need some level of help. And middle stage is the longest stage, most variety there. Late stage, a person is going to need around the clock care and help. So let's look at, we can look at the things that are in each of these stages. I said functions independently in the mild stage, problems with concentration, some challenges getting some tasks done and remembering new information. Again, it's not obvious, except to the person who has it and those closest to them. The middle stage is the longest stage, probably um, three to four or five years. Overall, I will tell you this, Alzheimer's disease from the time of diagnosis to the time of death, because it is a terminal illness, is between four and eight years, but, but anything goes. I've seen people live as long as 20 years. My husband lived eight years with the disease, but that middle stage is the longest. This is where more confusion with words, their vocabulary gets shorter, more simple. There might be some personality and behavior changes here, partly as a reaction to what's going on, but it can also be a primary problem in the brain that's causing personality and behavioral changes, forgetfulness, 
um, and changes in sleep patterns. In the late stages, these are, they're not in the bed all the time, but um, they're not able to respond to their environment. That means they, they really, they can't dress by themselves, they can't hold a conversation. Um, over time, they lose a lot of physical abilities. Um, there are other staging systems. There is a five system, there is a five stage system that puts a stage before early, which is called mild cognitive impairment. And really only the person um, themselves is aware they're just, their memory is not as good as it should be. And this is what Harvey, my husband was diagnosed with first, was mild cognitive impairment. Most mild cognitive impairment does progress to Alzheimer's disease, but, it, but not always. Some people just stay at mild cognitive impairment. And then this five-stage system I'm talking about, they break the middle stage into two, into early middle and late middle. There's also a seven-stage system that is used by clinicians in clinical settings to, um, there are stages and sub-stages so that they can communicate with each other and and know that, yes, I have a patient in stage 7C, and know specifically what that person can and cannot do. But for your purposes, um, I would also say that early stage, you may not be able to tell anything's going on unless you dig in deep. Um, and just because somebody has, also, just because somebody has mild stage doesn't mean they are capable of making decisions, signing. You're still going to have to ask your questions to get at it. So just because somebody has mild Alzheimer's doesn't mean one way or the other. Middle and late, yeah, they probably are not able to, um, to make decisions on their own. Um, in a way, let me look at my notes and see if there was anything else in this section. Oh, why, Dr. Go ahead. Hart, if you can pause for a moment, because to me, this is a great visual for us notaries. Um, and you just touched on it a bit about the stagings, because initially I was thinking, I'm totally okay with meeting with an individual who gets a little distracted, problems with concentration, who may not be able to tell me their grandchild's name or even be certain what day it is. But right. if I'm patient enough and um, give them time, eventually they should be able to answer my questions. But I was thinking late stage, this is probably an appointment that I will not want to go through with, um, with the notarization. And this could be when family members might be desperate enough to try to force a signing. Correct. Knowing that mom or dad it ain't getting better. It's not going to get better. There's not going to be a better day for the notary to come back, perhaps. But did you find your notes on that, what you were looking for? Oh, I was just looking to see if there was something I for that I didn't go over. But I wanted to say, too, that people don't necessarily progress through this logically and straightforward. You might have some symptoms in early and middle as you're progressing down this. So it's, and people progress at different rates. That's all. And, That's uh, all. Dr. Harmon, we did have a, a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Gina, Gina Waldrop asked, uh, are there certain open-ended questions we should ask before we notarize papers for a, for people 65 and older? So that's kind of uh, a question for us, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't feel comfortable answering yeah, that. Yeah, I don't. I didn't think you would. Um, yeah, but it's something to think about um, mm -hmm. because they're not necessarily going to be up to date on the current events or even care what the weather is. So, yeah. Yeah. What else would you add, Phyllis? 
Uh, well, I guess I would just ask, you know, you know, who's the current president? Do you know who the current president is? Do you know exactly where you are? You know, um, do you know exactly what you're signing? Do you know why you're signing this? You know, which is really questions we should be, you know, far, as far as signing, we should be asking everybody this, you know, that yeah, they I, understand what they're signing. I agree. Explain it. I agree with you, Phyllis. And Gina, I would not treat a 65 year old or older differently, like Phyllis said, because that could um, cause us to overlook the younger person who may have been diagnosed. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't get too hung up on the age. I would focus more on how they're presenting themselves. And if when scheduling the appointment, the individual or family member shared that they had the diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's. Okay, good. Uh, Denisha asks, what would be signs of early stage? For instance, remember dates, times, events, yeah, we're going to get to that. That's the All next right. half of Denisha, my presentation. Yeah. We'll get to that. Okay, those were your two questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, let's let me move on to that then. Um, so So now we're going to look at typical age-related memory versus common warning symptom signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. And there's there's 10, so this will be a good time when we go through all of these. Some of these you will you might pick up as your role as the notary, some you may not. Um, yeah. Let's see. And I, I really wish I could um, here we go. Share some of these videos um, because there I do this presentation has some videos of actual patients talking about what it's like um, to live with with it. And I, I want to I'm looking for this one slide. Well, hang on. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Take your time. Yeah. this. So we've already been through that. I think I have to click through all of this. Okay. I'm going to link this up. Actually, we're going to go through each of these. All right. Is there any questions before I get started on this section? No questions. Okay. So number one is memory loss, and it's memory loss that disrupts daily life. And this, this, these 10 slides are all going to have this um, orientation. So it's going to talk about the signs and then what might be normal for normal aging. So forgetting dates or events such that it impacts your life, forgetting that you had a doctor's appointment and a dentist appointment and missing those multiple times, using a lot of sticky notes and relying on family members to tell you where you should be and what you should do. Those might be signs of dementia. It is perfectly normal for all of us to sometimes forget names and appointments, right? But we know that we forgot. In dementia, oftentimes they don't even remember that they forgot something. So this was really the first sign that I knew something was wrong with Harvey. We were on a big family vacation and we had a guide who told us what we were doing every day and he could not remember what that guide told us and would ask me over and over again, now what time is breakfast? What am I supposed to be wearing? That kind of thing. So I think this is what people think of when they think of Alzheimer's disease and it's true but we've got nine other things to go through, right? Challenges in planning or solving problems. So this is taking on a new task and figuring out how to do it. Trying to figure out, for example, a new recipe. 
where in the past it might have not had any problem following a recipe. Um, getting a new bill and figuring out the best way to pay it. Um, taking longer to do complicated tasks. Now, it's it would be normal to make an occasional error when we're um, uh, balancing our checkbook, for example, especially if it was something that we didn't do very often. So this is very similar to sign number three, difficulty completing familiar tasks. So the first one was you're challenged with a new task and it just takes longer than it would have. This is where you would normally say like um, a recipe that you've done in your head all your life and now you can't remember how to do it or you get lost driving in a familiar location or you can't remember the rules of a game that you have played for a very long time. However, it's normal um, age related to not remember how to use the TV remote. Technology changes so quickly that our elder population has a hard time keeping up with that. So I wouldn't say that not knowing the settings on the microwave is necessarily a sign of dementia. So subtle differences. And, and when I listen to um, lectures about it, it you want to kind of shake them because it's so sh subtle. It's usually occasional this happens, that's normal. But when it happens a lot, it's not. So. Number four, confusion with time or place. And this again, I saw with Harvey on our trip, he could not keep the day of the week straight because we were out of norm. You know, when we were at home with a work schedule, we knew Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but on vacation, he had no clue what day of the week was um, or even what time it was. And normal, age-related changes. Yes, I forget what day of the week it is occasionally now that I'm retired, especially yesterday I thought was Saturday all day long. Um, but I figured it out and I knew it and I would remind myself. In dementia, they, they can't get, they don't understand they or can't remember how they got where they were. Let's see. trouble understanding visual images. I don't know that you guys are gonna see this, um, but this is that visual spatial thing. Um, it's really important with driving. You've gotta be able to judge distances and color differentials. And it's not that people with Alzheimer's have difficulty with their eyes. Their brains have difficulty deciphering what their eyes are seeing. And, um, and that can lead to difficulty with balance and lead to falling. Um, I saw this with Harvey when we were zip lining. He was a gifted natural athlete, but he couldn't figure out how to land on the platform. Um, he couldn't figure out where his feet were and where the platform was. So that was another sign for me. Maybe with you guys, there might be some difficulty um, like signing because they don't know where their hand is. Um, so you, you might see that, um, but it, that should be fairly easy to overcome. It's not a sign that they're they can't make judgments or think for themselves. It's just the brain is not processing the visual input correctly. But what about the trouble reading? Um, that to me, yeah. I'm thinking would could be a problem or a, um, a sign if they're not able to read the documents. Yeah, so, and that, you know, is that because of, like I said, the the brain can't process the words on the page or they can't understand what those words mean. I mean, it's, it's reading is a very complicated task for all of us. Um, I don't know I'll, how you guys. I'll interject here. My mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She was a passionate reader, read, preferred reading over television, movies. And as her disease progressed, that was an observation I made. She would buy books and never read them. And I knew there had to be another reason for that. Yeah. One of the little videos um, is a woman who talks about that in herself. She knows that she can no longer read a novel 
because she cannot remember what she just read on the page before. And if you can't remember what you read, the novel makes no sense. So maybe in with you guys, you can, if they can't read, you know, maybe they can comprehend through words, through listening. I don't know if that matters, um, if they it have matters. to be able to read the document or not. Yeah, yeah, because we're we're allowed to read it to them if they can't read it. Okay. So, at least in Texas, you know, every state has different right. rules and laws and 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 notary work. New problems with words or speaking in writing words. Um, so this this is really complicated too, and there's a lot here. So you might notice this in conversation if they just stop speaking because they've lost their train of thought and don't really know how to keep going. This is this is the repeating themselves again because they didn't know what they said. Word finding, um, trouble with, you know, that words on the tip of the tongue. Well, that's normal for all of us, right? And especially with names, but it comes to us eventually. People with dementia, it just doesn't come usually. Um, and then naming, difficulty naming something. If you point to an object, they might not be able just to name it right off the bat. So these are some things that you might see with speaking difficulty. If they can't come up with the word they want, they may talk around it. So they may say, if they can't come up with the word bed, they might say, you know, that place where you lie down. I mean, they're very creative of, of ways to get around not being able to come up with the right word. And sometimes the wrong word will pop out. So they may, instead of bed, bait may come out because it's similar and they know when it comes out, that's not right. Why did that word come out? Um, so you might, you might see that. And so they're having trouble communicating, not necessarily because they can't comprehend, although that might be part of it, but that language, that process of turning a word into something you say might be a presenting a presenting sign. Any questions here? Because that can get kind of complicated. Yeah, yeah I'm kind of comparing these. Uh, I'm kind of comparing these uh, signs to uh, myself and different people that I know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Sometimes having trouble finding the right word. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Yeah. But this is great information. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's see number seven here. Misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps. Okay. We all do that. We all misplace our keys. But we can usually, most of the time, retrace our steps and we for and we knew that we lost. When somebody with dementia misplaces something, they forget it. And then they might come across it in, a, in an unusual place because they've left it in an unusual place and they don't know how it got there because they can't retrace it. So they think of other explanations. Well, it, somebody must have moved it. Somebody must have stolen it because in their mind that makes more sense than it there, there's no other reason for it to be there. Um, yeah, that, that, and that can lead to some difficult um, conversations. <laughs> Why did you steal my glasses? Well, <laughs> I didn't. Let's see if we can go find them. Uh, poor judgment. So this is mostly with finances. Um, this is when telemarketers or even Nonprofits call, beg for money. You and I can usually figure out this is a scam and not send our money to some shady person. People with dementia don't have that ability to, um, to make that judgment. Um, might even be related to family members. If, um, you know, a family member is asking for money repeatedly you're gonna say yes until it reaches a certain point. But somebody with dementia may not know they've already given this person $5,000 when they're asking for another $5,000. So their judgment 
with money can be impaired. And then the point about less attention to grooming and keeping themselves clean, oftentimes they'll just, they just don't care anymore. Um, it may be too much to clean up the house or I'll get to it later. And it's just not that important because their world is so complicated then they're trying to juggle so many things in their lives that paying attention to wearing the same clothes two or three days in a row is just not that big a deal to them at that point. As opposed to typical age, neglecting to change your oil. Uh, and number nine, withdrawing from social activities. And this is usually because of the dementia. Their world is so hard and so difficult to navigate that they want to withdraw so that they don't draw attention to themselves. Um, and they don't want people to know, and it's just too hard to navigate a social situation. So that's where that comes from. And the lastly, changes in mood and personality is also usually because they are confused, they can become anxious about that and they can become depressed about it. And that might be unusual for that person. But Alzheimer's disease also directly affects personality at times too, right? And then they're comparing this with a typical age-related change of um, yeah, being irritable when, when my routine is disrupted. Yes. Um, all right. And so that's the end of those. I think, I think that's really helpful. Um, it is. It really is. And the way it's broken down, it's easy for me to uh, remember and have some takeaways. I really like slide number six. Um, that really brought it home for me. Yeah, I think this is where you guys are going to see it more than anywhere else. I agree. Mm -hmm. Is that conversation? Yes, yes, I agree too. I do. And uh, yeah, you can tell. Uh, when you're when you're talking to them, when somebody that might have uh, show, show these signs, um, it's just kind of that that opportunity to talk to them gives us the ability to kind of visualize, we'll see, you know, mm -hmm. and hear how they respond and be able to make some type of determination, you know, just, I mean, that's all we have to go by. Really. Exactly. You know, exactly. we're not doctors, but you know, we do have to do some due diligence to make sure that they understand. And the best way to do that, I think it's going to be through that the conversation. So number six is is on point for us. And Phil, let me know if you agree or not. I see us asking these questions um, possibly even before um we're asking for id not not that you have to do it that early but to me as soon as i am in front of them my focus needs to zero in on whomever will be signing and start this conversation keep it easy don't come across like you're quizzing them because i feel that that might make them nervous and and make some mistakes or be confused and related to the disease just how are you feeling today i see you called me here what document is it that you'd like uh, for me to watch you sign um, and then focus on how they're responding to you is it logical coherent clear smooth um yes. so yeah I, i'm gonna do it early in the process not late and you know and we do have to be careful i mean we have to do this with with everybody we can't just do it with the the uh ones that we uh suspect suspect might have a challenge now we can ask the ones that we suspect might have a challenge we might we can ask them more questions but we should be asking these questions of all of our signers. So we have to also keep that in mind too. This was uh, wonderful information. 
Does anyone in the audience have questions for Dr. Harmon, Phyllis, or myself? Anything at all? You can unmute yourself and ask the question. You can raise your hand, ask the question. Let's see. Let me go to questions. Okay. Oh. It is some questions in here. Let's see. Uh, Gina said, great slides. <laughs> Thanks, Gina. And Gina Thank also you. asked, uh, at what point do we say we cannot do the signing? I say, Gina, I say as soon as you feel uh, uncomfortable, as soon as you feel there's a problem, as soon as you feel that that signer does not understand what is going on. You can just say, I don't feel comfortable. The signer doesn't seem to understand what's going on. You probably need to contact an attorney. And I've done this many times. Mm -hmm. You know, and usually you can kind of be on the lookout too, because a lot of times when somebody has some type of problems, they're usually not the ones that call for the appointment. It's usually a family member that will call for the appointment. That's a good point, Phyllis. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of when that wasn't the case, but no, it nearly always is a family member. Um, no, and family then, member. You know, I go ahead and quiz that family member. You know, they'll say, well, can you come to notarize some documents? I ask, is it for you or someone else? And then they'll say it's from my mother. And then I link to that the type of document. If we're talking about a will, last will and testament, power of attorney, health care directive. Now I'm putting the pieces together. OK, so and I ask right on that phone call, booking the appointment, is he or she able to communicate with me? Um, Clearly, will they be able to understand the document? And so I've declined appointments just from the phone call, but when not, I defer to what Phyllis said. And as soon as I have that conversation and see the red flags, I don't waste my time because I don't want to waste my time, but I don't want to waste the family's time either. Uh, Belinda asked, uh, sh Belinda Sands, she asked, should we ask prior to an appointment if, if someone has been diagnosed with dementia prior? Uh, I've never done that. I've never asked prior to the appointment. However, uh, based on uh, what Michelle does by asking all of these questions, during the time that you're speaking with the family member that's trying to make that appointment, uh, if you ask enough questions, they will go ahead and let you know most of the time that, yes, um, they they do suffer from either uh, Alzheimer's or dementia or, eat, or some type of illness. And so you yeah. just, but you don't know, you have to ask questions to see what, what stage they're at. And let me let me interject there too because Dr. Harmon. Like, like like we said, if just because somebody has been diagnosed with dementia, it may be very early, they can still sign. And also symptoms can come and go. It's not all the time, all the way. So they might have be very lucid one day and be very confused another day. And there may be a time of day that's better where they're completely lucid. So you could ask the family, when, when is the best time for me to come? That's a great point. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. You know, cause I have had uh, people tell me that um, for, a, for a signer with, uh, Alzheimer's that, you know, my mother's having a good day today. So uh, we like to get this done. Yeah. You know, because she understands everything that's going on. Yeah. You know, so. And my mother tended to be better in the morning, early part of the day, but around five, six, seven in the afternoon, it seemed as if something 
came over her. That's when her behaviors would be more severe. Yeah, we call that sundowning. You okay. probably heard that. Yeah. Good to go. Anybody else have any questions? Well, okay. I think this was a fantastic presentation, Dr. Oh, Harmon. Yeah. We definitely appreciate you. Wait, let's look. Okay, let's see. Just making sure we got all, looked like we did get all the questions. And I think this information is available on the Alzheimer's Association website. The videos might even be available, I'm not sure. But I know they have a slide similar to this one, um, some handouts and sites. So they're they're a good resource. Hey Phyllis, I'm thinking um, after today we could reach back out to Dr. Harmon. I'm thinking about our um, clubhouse meetings. Uh, Ooh, yeah. see if we can't get her to be a guest for us there um, because. Phyllis's students are in Texas, mine are in Alabama, Clubhouse covers all 50 states. Um, and, and really this has helped me tremendously because right now my focus is primarily general notary work. But those of you in the audience, this per even pertains to loan signings. Even you might think you don't have to worry about this because um, if they got approved for mortgage um, or to buy a home, they should be fine. No, this is something for every notarization you need to be aware of. And, you know, speaking of loan finance, especially the reverse mortgage, because that is primarily our senior community doing those reverse mortgages. You know, so you, you definitely want to take heed and take care when you're dealing with those type of loan closings. So this was, yeah, I mean, this, this covers the gamut mm -hmm. here. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Harmon. I, I really appreciate this. It's and I think welcome. we will have to revisit this subject again. <laughs> but and Dr. we'll Harmon figure out how to do the audio. So the video supply. Because I would I like to see those. Figure that out. Yeah. 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 But Dr. Harmon, before we wrap up, can, are there any um, final words or comments about Alzheimer's um, and its impact on public health? Mm. Um, we need the research. Um, if you've got dollars to spare, we need the research. We need to figure out the basic science behind this. What starts this and how can we combat it? Um, there are things that you can do. We talked about risk factors that you don't have any control over, right? Your gender and your age and your ethnicity. But there are known dietary and exercise and sleep habits that we should all be doing. And they're all healthy habits that we all know about that can help prevent Alzheimer's disease too. We, we, we really all need to be making sure we're doing those too. I will make an impact. Review those quickly for us, if you don't mind. Well, here's a quick caveat. Anything that's good for the brain, I mean, Anything that's good for the heart is good for the brain. So diet, the only known diet that helps prevent Alzheimer's is the Mediterranean diet. Fish, small amounts of chicken, vegetables, herbs, um, the Mediterranean diet is the only diet that we know. Sleeping, getting adequate sleep, here, this was very interesting. We found out, we know now, that when you sleep, your brain cleans out plaques and tangles. And if you're not getting good restorative sleep, those plaques and tangles will build. But that is when that is one time that those plaques and tangles are being swept out of the brain. So sleep is important. Exercise, and it's what your doctor has always told you, 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise, divided up any way you want to, 
has been proven to help your brain and help your heart. Um, keeping active physically, keeping active socially prevents Alzheimer's disease. So not becoming a hermit, but keeping active socially, keeping active mentally helps prevent Alzheimer's disease. So reading about new subjects, taking up a new language, taking up a new musical instrument, using your brain in new ways also helps prevent. We all know that. <laughs> it we helps to be reminded. We just needed a reminder, Dr. Harmon. <laughs> we do. And, and Dr. Harmon, because we're small business owners, we we have to do everything for a business. You follow me? And I think, well, not I think, I know I've been guilty of this, just putting work first and foremost behind everything else. Phyllis, I thought about you when she said, learn something new, like a language. Um, Phyllis is learning new languages. And I mean, she's wow. going all in. So good for you. Yeah, yeah. Got to keep that brain working. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Harmon. This was fantastic. Oh, uh, Denisha had one more question. She said, does sleep apnea relate to Al Alzheimer's? That's a great question, Denisha. Yes. So that is one, of, that's a risk factor, a health risk factor for, for um, dementia. And you can imagine when you have sleep apnea, that means your, your airway is cut off. You're not breathing. The oxygen level in your brain goes down. Your brain cells need oxygen. So you're putting your brain cells at risk. So treating sleep apnea with the CPAP machine or whatever is going to help prevent dementia. Yes. Wow. So those people that have sleep, uh, I have sleep apnea, you know, and I, I'm very comfortable. I, I can't sleep without my machine. Oh, it's, it's your best friend. Of, yeah. A lot of people that have it don't want to use the machine. I mean, I, my it, travels with me wherever I go, you know. It's, it's come simple. a long way. It's much, much better now mm -hmm. than it was. I, I tell patients, don't worry about it. You'll love it. You'll, you know. That was a good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today and uh, sharing, uh, being able to share this great information that, um, being able to hear this great information that Dr. Harmon shared with us, i uh, tell you with the eye opener for me, and it's just reinforcing, okay, Phyllis, this is why you need to keep doing what you're doing. This is why you need to keep moving. This is why, you, you know, not only for our clients, but also for ourselves too, especially if you're in that, you know, what we call the prime time age, and that's over 55. Uh, Michelle, you have any last words you want to share? Yes, I would like to share again. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. This is what Phyllis and I hoped for and you delivered. So thank you very much. And then those of you in the audience, when you find yourself at an appointment and you've identified some of these symptoms and you're confident that they are pretty sure that you should not proceed with the notarization, I want to encourage you to be tactful with your words by how you refuse. You know, it shouldn't be, oh, no, I can't do this. Um, he's got dementia. Instead, frame it so that, you know what, it, um, Alabama law, Texas law requires that your mother, your parent, your spouse, um, be able to communicate with me or be able to understand what he or she is signing. And it appears right now that isn't so. So I, let's postpone or um, reschedule perhaps to another time. But for right now, I'm, I won't be able to complete the notarization. So be very tactful and sensitive. Um, and um, go from there. But yeah, don't compromise when you know there's an issue. 
Um, I, we know you want to help. We all do. But in this, in some of these instances, we won't be able to. And I like what Phyllis said. Go ahead and recommend that they get legal advice from an attorney who will be able to assist them. Um, and again, remember, Notary Gals is here every second Saturday. And if there are any other topics that you would like for us to bring to you, just um, reach out to Phyllis or I and we'll do our best to bring in another expert. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is the end of our uh, training for uh, webinar Saturday. Again, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. And Phyllis, you're gonna stop recording and we'll chat with Dr. Herman. Yeah, let me figure out how to... <laughs> Stop the recording. <laughs> okay. That wasn't no, it. No, I'm not going to stop recording. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll no chat and not, not keep that part in the uh, video. I'll edit it out. <laughs> All right. Because I can't figure out how to do that. That's all right. Yeah. You know, full disclosure, we went to, uh, we switched platforms. We went to the webinar platform instead of the meeting platform. And so we're all learning how to use this from Dr. Harmon. Well, I'm so glad you guys came on early with me and we figured all, oh, that would have been a mess. <laughs> nah, something tells me you would have been fine. Dr. Herman, do you use an iPhone or an Android phone? iPhone. Good. Have you heard of Clubhouse? No. You haven't. All right. So I am going to send you an email, uh, email with information about Clubhouse. It is a new social media platform that is strictly... Um, on your phone, it's strictly audio. There is no visual. There is no way to type and communicate. Um, I would liken it to the original conference calls or party lines. And I know it sounds bizarre, but um, it is where, oh, anyone and everyone can host a meeting, a discussion, and what's unique is it encompasses the world. It is in, I don't know how many countries now. Huh. So um, you get a really diverse audience, and um, Phyllis and I and two other instructors, um, Sundays at three, we host a room, that is a topic and you, this topic, we may wanna talk with you. It may not need to just be focused on notaries. It may, but we might decide to open it up. But this information touches every human, okay? So um, again, I'll send you an email, you think it over, you know, and you may feel it's not the right platform. I think it would be and mm -hmm. we're you would, again, do your part of the presentation, then we open it up and the audience is able to come up and they ask their question and answer. So, okay. yeah, good, good. So, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to add too that uh, there are a lot of doctors, MDs on, <laughs> on Clubhouse. Uh, yes. Yeah. A lot of great information out okay. there. I think yeah. I have heard of it now that you say that and describe it. I, th I think I have. Yeah, it oh, is it's really, it's really, it's really neat. I mean, you, I just, it's like going back to school almost. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What keeps I mean, people from talking on top of each other? Ah. Uh, oh well. Yeah. The, <laughs> well, it's basically the way the the way the app is set up. You know. It's, it's, it is a little bit hard to explain, but, you know, when you create the club, the person that created the club and opens up a room is going to be the moderator. Okay. So they're going to have the controls. So they control who can talk. 
So right. the moder when the moderator is talking, you know, they can invite other people and make them moderators too. But you, you know, you don't have too many moderators at one time. So the moderators know the rules, so they not, they're not going to talk over each other. And in order for somebody in the audience to ask a question, they have to raise their hand, and then one of the moderators has to uh, bring them up on what's called the stage, an imaginary stage. And then uh, they can unmute themselves and ask a question. When their question is answered, they go back down to the audience where they're automatically muted again. Okay. So, the okay. mute, so the audience is muted the whole time. The okay. only people that can unmute themselves are the uh, moderators, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know? yeah. so it's not a free-for-all. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's like very, this. Mm, it's only. very organized. Yeah, it, is. it can be that. There are some groups who like that free for all and everyone is talking over each other, but that would drive Phyllis and I nuts. And so we, we prefer that more structured environment. But again, the lives you can touch, the reach is incredible. So I'll Might send you- something for me to look into for my own. Great. So I'll send you an email as well as an invitation, and it's no rush. Once you know you learn more and decide if you want to proceed, and then we can schedule something in the next few months um, when it works for you, and um, and we'll ask you if you want to broaden the the audience, you know, or or the topic or whatever. Well. Leave that to you, but this was great. Good. It was, Dr. Harmon. Thank you so much. So I'm kind of glad we did it that way. I, I think I would have gone way over if I had played all those little videos they wanted me to play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was convinced you found the presentation. I was like, wow, that's a lot of content. Uh -huh. So you're right. So you see now, I think the 10 warning signs I do too. if you were to develop one for notaries that's your key that's slide golden. you still need the background the inform the definitions but and yeah the that's neat right there yeah and and the yeah because well i just found the stages so so uh well, yeah. informational you know yeah, and that's you shared that there were different different types of stages, you know, it may, it makes me want to. Uh, I said I made a mental note to go out there and research the mm -hmm. other stages. So I mean, this was just great information. It was. I mean, I, I can't get over, I can't get over that. So I'm just so happy that you agreed to do that for us, and yeah. we will provide a list of people that uh, did attend. That's we'll right. That. Yeah, and okay. I'll, I'll let you know that we had we had this issue with the audio. Um, okay, <laughs> that doesn't need to happen again. Well, it may not have been on your end, so yeah. Okay. Thank right. you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank bye you. Bye. -bye.